we will acquire a little insight into the human being if we speak today of just a few, among the enormous number, of facts relating to what we call the astral world. As you know, the content of the human soul is very rich and diverse. Today let us bring to mind a portion of this soul content. Let us consider certain qualities of soul. In our soul life we live within the fullest range of feelings and emotions and in thoughts, images, ideas and will impulses. From morning to evening all this unfolds in our life of soul. If we observe the human being in a superficial way, this soul life rightly appears to us as self-contained, as inwardly consistent. Just consider how your life flows by, how in the morning you entertain the first thought of the day, and the first emotion flickers through your soul, your first will impulse emerges. And consider how until consciousness sinks into sleep again at night, idea after idea, feeling after feeling, will impulse after will impulse continually succeed one another. All this appears like a steady flow. From a deeper perspective, though, this is not such a continuous flow, for we are always connected with higher worlds, though most people are unaware of this, through our thoughts, feelings, and sentience. Today, let us consider this relationship of ours with the astral world. When we have some feeling or other, when joy or alarm flare in our soul, Initially this is an occurrence within our soul, but it is not merely that. If one is able to examine this clairvoyantly, it becomes apparent that something like a luminous stream emanates from a person at the moment of alarm or joy, and that this enters the astral world. It does not enter it haphazardly or arbitrarily, though, but makes its way to a being within the astral world. In other words, when a feeling shimmers up in us, we enter into a connection with the being of the astral world. Let us assume that some thought occupies a place in our soul. Let's say that we reflect on the nature of a table. As this thought quivers through our soul, the clairvoyant can demonstrate how a current issues from this thought and seeks out a being of the astral world. And the same is true of every thought, every mental picture, every emotion. From the whole current of life that issues from the soul, streams continually flow toward the most diverse beings of the astral world. It would be quite wrong to think that these outflowing streams all went to a single being in the astral world. This is not so. Instead, the most varied currents stream from all these separate thoughts emotions and feelings and connect with the most diverse beings of the astral world. This is the remarkable thing here, that as individuals we are not connected with just a single such being, but that we spin the most diverse threads connecting us to the most diverse beings of the astral world. The astral world is populated by a large number of entities just as the physical world is and these beings are connected with us in the most varied and diverse ways. But if we wish to gain insight into the full complexity of this, we also have to consider something else. Let us assume that two people see a flash of lightning and both have a very similar feeling in response to it. From each of the two, a current emanates, but both of these now flow to one and the same being in the astral world. We can say, therefore, that there is a being, an inhabitant of the astral world, with whom the two beings of the physical world establish a connection. It may be that not just one, but fifty, one hundred, or one thousand human beings have similar sentiments or perceptions and emit currents which stream toward a single being of the astral world. In uniting in this one point, these thousand human beings establish a connection with the same being of the astral world. But now, picture the other different emotions, feelings, and thoughts which these people, 
who share the same emotion in this one instance, carry within them. Through these other currents, they are connected with other entities in the astral world, and in consequence, the most diverse connecting threads pass from the astral world into the physical world. Now, it is possible to distinguish certain categories of beings in the astral world. We gain an idea of these different classes most easily if we consider the following example. Take a large number of Europeans and examine for a moment the concept or idea of justice contained in their souls. People may otherwise have the most varied experiences and therefore connect with the most diverse beings of the astral world in the most intricate and complex ways. But when these people think about the concept of justice in the same way, appropriate it in the same way, they all connect with one being of the astral world. And we can regard this being of the astral world really as a center, a focal point from which issue rays toward all those who share this idea. Whenever such people call to mind their concept of justice, they are connected with this single being. Just as we have flesh and blood and are composed of it, So this being is constituted of the concept of justice. It lives within it. Likewise, there are astral beings for the concepts of courage, benevolence, fortitude, revenge, and so forth. So you see that qualities we can have as human beings, the contents of our soul, correspond to beings in the astral world. This means that something like an astral net spreads out over a large number of people. All of us who share the same concepts of justice are embedded in the body of an astral entity whom we could really call the being of justice. All of us who share the same concepts of courage, fortitude and so forth are connected with one and the same astral being constituted of and embodying justice courage, or fortitude. Thus each one of us is a kind of conglomeration of streams, for we can regard each person as receiving from all directions streams sent out by astral beings. All of us are a confluence of streams entering us from the astral world. During the winter lectures we will increasingly be able to show how the human being is basically a confluence of streams, as I have described, and focuses these streams within him around the central point of his I, capital. You see, the most important thing for human soul life is that we concentrate all these streams around a focal point which lies within our self-awareness. This self-awareness is so important in us since it must hold sway like a ruler in our inner human entelechy, encompassing and connecting the diverse streams that flow into us from all sides. Were self-awareness to lapse, the human being might immediately cease to feel himself a unity and all the diverse concepts of courage, fortitude and so forth might then fall asunder. A person would then cease to have the sense of being a unity, but would instead feel himself sundered into all the different streams. A person can, in a sense, lose directing mastery over what streams into him. And here we see how we can gain understanding of the spiritual world through insight into the real state of affairs. Consider that as a single individual you have lived a particular kind of life, experiencing various things, and from youth onward nurturing a number of ideals which gradually developed in you. Every such ideal can be different from another. You have had the ideal of courage, fortitude, benevolence, and so forth, thereby entering into streams from the most diverse astral beings. There is also another way in which we can engage with a diverse succession of streams from astral beings. Assume we have had a number of friendships during our life, 
very particular feelings and emotions will have developed under the influence of these friendships, especially during our youth. In this way, streams went out to a specific being in the astral world. Then a new friendship entered our life, connecting us, therefore, with a different being of the astral world, and so on, throughout life. Now let us assume that the psyche suffered disturbance, so that the eye lost mastery over the various different streams and was no longer able to hold them together. We would arrive at a state when we ceased to feel ourselves as an I, capital, as an intact entity, as a unity within our self-awareness. If we were to lose our I through a process of mental illness, we would no longer experience these streams as something through which we perceive ourselves, but as if we were flowing out and dissolving into them. Certain cases of mental illness only become comprehensible when we consider them from this perspective, that of the astral world. One such case is Friedrich Nietzsche. Many of you will probably have heard that Friedrich Nietzsche suffered an outbreak of madness during the winter of 1888-89. Readers of his last letters will find it interesting to observe how Friedrich Nietzsche fragmented into diverse streams at the moment when he lost his capital I. For instance, he writes to this or that friend, or also notes to himself, quote, A god lives in Turin, who was once a professor of philosophy in Basel, but he was not egotistical enough to remain so. Close quote. In other words, he had lost his eye, and he clothed this fact in words such as these, quote, And the god Dionysus walks by the Po. Close quote. And he looks down on all his ideals and friendships, which wander below him. Sometimes he thinks he is King Carlo Alberto, at other times someone else, sometimes even one of the criminals he was reading about during the last days of his life. At this time there were two murder cases which had attracted much attention, and at moments in his illness he identified with these lady killers. He no longer experienced his eye, but instead a stream flowing into the astral world. In abnormal cases, therefore, Separate currents, otherwise made to cohere by our center of self-awareness, rise to the surface of life. It will become ever more necessary for people to know what lies in the depths of the soul. You see, we would be endlessly impoverished if we were unable to produce many such streams that enter the astral world, and our nature would be very restricted if we were unable, by deepening our lives spiritually, to gain mastery over all these streams. We really must say, therefore, that we are not confined within our skin, but extend beyond it on all sides into other worlds, which in turn penetrate into our world. A whole network of entities is spun out over the astral world. Now let us examine in a little more detail a few of these entities that are connected with us in this way. These are beings that present themselves to us roughly as follows. The astral world surrounds us. Let us conceive of such a being, say, the one relating to the concept and feeling of courage. It stretches its tentacles out in all directions, and these tentacles enter human souls. As people develop courage, a connection is created between this being of courage and the human soul. Other people are different. All, for instance, who develop a certain kind of feeling of love or anxiety are connected with the being of the astral world. When we engage with these beings, we enter into what we can say constitutes life in the astral world, its social coherence. As people live here on the physical plane, they are not merely separate beings. Here on the physical plane, too, we are involved in hundredfold and thousandfold interconnections. We have legal arrangements with one another and are involved in friendships and such like. Our connections on the physical plane are governed by our ideas, concepts, mental pictures and so on. In a certain sense, the social connections of the beings we have been considering on the astral plane must likewise be governed in some way. So how do these beings coexist with each other? 
They do not have a dense physical body of flesh and blood as we do. Instead, they have astral bodies, are composed at most of etheric substance. They stretch out their feelers into our world. But how do they live together? If these beings did not collaborate, our human life would also be quite different. Basically, our physical world is only the external expression of what occurs on the astral plane. Picture a being in the astral world, the being of justice, to whom stream all thoughts relating to justice. Then picture another, to whom flow all thoughts relating to giving. If the idea forms in our soul that giving is justice, then a stream issues from both these beings and enters our soul. We are connected with both. But how do these two beings bear with one another? One might be tempted to think that social or communal coexistence on the astral plane is the same as on the physical plane, yet it is different in very important respects. It is wrong merely to place the different planes one above the other and characterize what happens in the higher worlds as closely resembling occurrences in the physical world. There is a huge difference between the physical world and the higher worlds, one which becomes ever greater the higher we ascend. Above all, the astral world is distinguished by a singular quality that cannot be found on the physical plane at all. This is the permeability, the penetrability of the matter of the astral plane. In the physical world, it is impossible for you to stand at exactly the same place as another person, and thus impenetrability is a law of the physical world. This is not true in the astral world, and there the law of permeability prevails. There it is certainly possible, and even the usual thing, for beings to interpenetrate, for one being to enter the space already occupied by another. Two, four, a hundred beings can be at one and the same place simultaneously in the astral world. What this means, though, in turn, is that the logic of communal coexistence is quite different on the astral plane from the physical plane. You can best grasp the nature of this difference, this different logic, not the logic of thinking, but that of action, if you consider the following example. Imagine that a city council decided to build a church at a certain location. The council would inevitably first have to discuss how to build it, how to organize this, and so on. Now, let's assume there are two groups on the council, and that the two have different ideas about architecture and the choice of building company. On the physical plane, the two parties will be at loggerheads and unable to carry out their plans until one of them gets the upper hand and carries the day, securing agreement as to the design of the church. You are aware, of course, that the great majority of human social interactions involve such discussion and negotiation before anything is realized, so that people can first agree about what should actually be done. Nothing at all would get done unless, in most cases, one party prevailed and secured a majority. The minority party will not easily concede that it was in the wrong, but instead will go on believing it was right. In the physical world we are involved, therefore, in discussion about ideas that must be decided purely within this physical world, since it is impossible for two different plans to be realized at one and the same location. In the astral world things are completely different. There it would be perfectly possible to build, say, two churches at one and the same place. In fact, such things continually occur in the astral world, and this alone is the right and proper thing there. Disputes do not occur there as they do in the physical world. Meetings are not held where a majority opinion is sought for this or that venture, nor is there any need at all for this. When a council meeting takes place and forty out of forty-five councillors have one view while the others have another, it is not so dire if the two parties feel like murdering each other because of their differences of opinion, since these things come to immediate outward expression, are voiced. One party will not try to build its church without regard to the other, 
Since on the physical plane a thought can remain a content of the soul, it can remain within us. Things are not so straightforward on the astral plane. There, when an idea is formed, in a certain sense it already exists. Thus, if an astral being, such as those I have been speaking of, has a thought, it immediately extends the corresponding feelers which have the form of this thought, while another extends its own feelers, and both interpenetrate, and now exist in the same space as a newly formed entity. Thus the most diverse opinions, thoughts, and feelings continually interpenetrate. The most contrary things can interpenetrate in the astral world. While disagreement occurs in the physical world about such things as we have mentioned, in the astral world actual conflict immediately arises. You see, as beings in the astral world you cannot restrain a thought within yourself since thoughts immediately become deeds and objects immediately materialize. Now, it is true that churches are not built there, as they are on the physical plane, but let us assume that a being of the astral world wished to realize something, while another sought to prevent it. These things cannot be discussed, but here the principle applies that things must prove their worth. If the two sets of feelers are now present in the same space, they start battling, and then the more fruitful and thus more justified idea, the one that can therefore persist, will destroy the other and be realized. Here, therefore, we have a continual conflict of the most diverse views, thoughts, and emotions. On the astral plane, every opinion inevitably becomes deed. Instead of dispute, opinions are left to battle it out themselves, and the more fruitful one will knock the other out of the ring you can say that the astral world is a much more dangerous one, and some of what is said about such dangers is connected with what I have now described. Everything becomes deed there, and views have to battle with one another rather than discuss and argue. I will now touch on something that is shocking to hear in our materialistic age, but is nevertheless true. We have often stressed that in our era people are increasingly immersing themselves in consciousness of a world that is merely physical, thus also in characteristically physical qualities, distinctive characteristics of the physical world. For instance, a world where, in discussion and dispute, each person feels like murdering another who does not share his view or regards him as an idiot. Things are not like that in the astral world. There a being will say, quote, other opinions do not bother me, close quote. The greatest tolerance exists there. If one view proves more fruitful, it will knock the others out of the ring. Other opinions can happily exist alongside one's own, since battle will sort it all out. If you gradually come to be at home in the world of spirit, you have to learn to judge things according to what is customary there. The first domain of the spiritual world is the astral, where what I have described is customary. Someone who comes to be at home in the spiritual world must, in a sense, make, himself, make space in himself for the customs of the beings who live there. And this is the right thing to do. Our physical world should increasingly become a reflection of the spiritual world, and we will introduce ever more harmony into our world through accomplishing the following. Life in the physical world ought to unfold as it does in the astral world. Although we cannot build two churches in one spot, where views differ, we can allow their fruitfulness to interpenetrate in the world. The most fruitful or productive views will be victorious, as is the case in the astral world. Thus, within a universal spiritual stream, the distinctive qualities of the astral world can really reach down into the physical world. The spiritual scientific movement has a broad field to cultivate here, to create, increasingly, a reflection of the astral world on the physical plane. 
however shocking it may sound to people today who only acknowledge the physical plane and can therefore only conceive of propounding one opinion and seeing anyone who has a different view as a fool. Adherence of a spiritual worldview will find it increasingly self-evident for absolute inner tolerance of different views to prevail. This is not the sort of tolerance that arises in us like heeding a sermon, but something instead that will take up its natural place in our soul as we increasingly acquire the customs of the higher worlds. What has been described here, this interpenetrability, is a very important and key quality of the astral world. No being of the astral world will develop a concept of truth such as those we know here in the physical world. The beings of the astral world find debate, argument and so forth to be entirely unproductive. They agree with Goethe that, quote, fruitful things alone are true, close quote. We should not come to know truth through theoretical reflections, but through their productiveness, through the way in which they prove their value. One being of the astral world will, therefore, never dispute with another, as people do, but will say, fine, you do your thing, I'll do mine, we will see which is the more productive idea, and which will knock the other out of the ring. If we engage with this way of thinking, we have already acquired some practical insight. We should not think that our developments into the spiritual world is accomplished in a tumultuous way, for actually it occurs subtly. And if we can attend carefully and acquire a quality such as the distinctive characteristic of the astral world I just described, we will increasingly come to regard feelings such as those possessed by astral beings as models for our own. If we allow ourselves to be guided by the character of the astral world, we can be hopeful of living our way upward toward the spiritual beings whose life in this way will become increasingly apparent to us. It is this that will prove fruitful for human beings. What has been aired today aims in many respects to be a kind of preparation for the subject matter of the next two lectures. We have been speaking of the nature of the astral world and its distinctive characteristics. But we should be aware already that this astral world is far more distinct from higher worlds, say the world of Devakan, than people might tend to think. Truly, the astral world is also present wherever our physical world exists. It permeates our physical world. And everything we have spoken of on past occasions always surrounds us is present in the same space as physical realities and physical beings. But then there is also the world of Devakan, which is distinct from the astral world inasmuch as we experience it in a different state of consciousness. You might easily think that this physical world here is permeated by the astral world, the world of Devakan and so on. But things aren't quite so simple as that. If we wish to describe the higher worlds in more detail than we did before, we must be clear that another difference exists between the astral world and the world of Devakan. You see, our astral world in which we live and which penetrates our physical space is in a sense a dual world, whereas the world of Devakan is in any way a single world. This is something we needed to mention today as preparation. In a sense, there are two astral worlds. These two differ in as much as the first is, as it were, the astral world of goodness, while the other is the astral world of evil. It would be incorrect to make such a blunt distinction in the case of the world of Devakan. If we consider the worlds in descending sequence, we have to see them as follows. First, higher Devakan, then the lower world of Devakan, then the astral world, and then the physical world. This does not yet give us the totality of our worlds, for we also have to consider those lower than the physical. Below our physical world there is another lower astral world. The good astral world lies above the physical plane, while the astral world of evil lies below it, and likewise for all practical purposes penetrates it. Now the most diverse streams flow into the beings of the astral world. 
Here we must distinguish between streams of good and bad qualities issuing from human beings. The good streams pass to a good being, and the bad streams correspondingly connect with a bad being of the astral world. If we take the sum of all good and bad beings of the astral world, in a sense we have two astral worlds. When we observe the world of Devakan, we will see that this is not true to the same degree. The astral world therefore contains two worlds which interpenetrate and both equally connect with the human being. These two worlds must be distinguished from each other, chiefly in regard to the way they originated. Looking back to the past evolution of the earth, we come to a time when the earth was still united with sun and moon. At a later period the earth itself was a moon, a planetary body outside the sun during the old moon era. At that time an astral world already existed before our earth became the planet it now is. If this astral world had been able to evolve further without hindrance, it would have become the good astral world. Due to the fact that the moon separated from the earth, however, the evil astral world was incorporated into the general astral world. In our current state on earth, we have now reached the point of incorporation of an evil astral world. In future, an evil world will likewise be incorporated into the world of Devakan. For the time being, let us keep in mind that there are two astral worlds rather than one. Into the first enter all the streams that are productive for human progress and evolution, and into the other astral world, to which Kamaloka likewise belongs, enter all the streams that inhibit human evolution. In both astral worlds, there are entities whose influence on us and whose mode of coexistence with each other we have heard about today in a more abstract way.